Hi, this is Rachel on Recover. We've got a special guest, Stephanie. She's here uh, to tell us about neurofeedback. Uh, Stephanie, tell us a little about yourself. Um, uh, hi, Rachel. So it's good to meet you. Um, so my name is Stephanie Garcia. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, board certified neurotherapy, um, licensed in both Texas and Hawaii. And um, I focus on QEG guided neurofeedback. Okay. So how did you get into mental health? Um, I've always, for one thing, I've always had a love for the brain since I can remember. Um, and I've always thought outside the box. Um, so like growing up in Los Angeles, uh, I remember passing by homeless people as a kid and, you know, even at like four years old asking my dad, you know, how come these people are homeless? And he'd say, um, you know, well, they made their choices that led them there. And I, I just knew even at four years old that there was something else. There was, there was something more to their story. And it had me kind of thinking about human behavior and traumas and what, what could have happened to these people. And so I started thinking more about the brain and psychology, even from a very young age. Um, and I've just always, always known that I wanted to either be a psychologist or work in mental health. Um, and like I said, I've always had a love for the brain and human behavior. So it just, it interests me. Okay. Uh, what helps you focus, what helped you get into working with neurofeedback? Um, so that one's interesting. So in grad school, um, as a licensed clinical, uh, marriage and family therapist, I was being taught different interventions. So basically what we say to a potential client after they say their part of their narrative and I just knew instinctually that there's something missing there. Um, so we know that trauma is held throughout the body. And many of my clients have called after reading The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. A lot of people have heard of that one. Um, tremendous book about healing from trauma and how the body stores or remembers uh, traumatic events. Um, and so we were learning about these different interventions, and we know that traumatic, traumatic memory is primarily held in the limbic system in the midbrain. Um, and we speak to each other using primarily the frontal lobe, our temporal lobes, different memory centers that are found in different areas of the brain. And it's very difficult to reach the inner workings of the midbrain by talk therapy alone. And so I was thinking, you know, we're, we're kind of just reaching the surface, you know, how do we deal with, you know, how do we talk people out of things like addiction and eating disorders and traumatic brain injuries? Those are things that are going to take a brain based solution. Um, and so I started doing my research while still in my um, last year of grad school, um, reached out to a lot of colleagues um, that were on the mainland and found there was such a thing. And that is neurofeedback. Um, so I brought that to, uh, Maui, um, held a big conference and taught a bunch, you know, a lot of professionals, uh, throughout the islands about this, this new kind of, um, kind of intricate, you know, interplay between psychology and neuroscience and how it can help. And just, we've had a lot of success. And so now it's just a major part of therapy. And that was nine years ago. So, okay. Um, can you, uh, can you kind of explain some of the history behind neurofeedback? Sure. So, um, it helps to kind of really understand, um, neurofeedback and kind of how it works. Um, so neurofeedback is biofeedback for the brain. So we use an EEG or electroencephalograph, and that kind of translates to electrical brain picture, which measures brainwave activity, which are the firing of your different patterns of neurons in the brain. We have trillions of neurons. And then we use auditory and visual stimuli as rewards to correct any brain imbalances. And so that training of the brain uh, towards more normative, comfortable frequencies help people to attend more to um, their environment, be more, um, be able to be more uh, concentrated, be able to be more present, they're more authentic selves, relax anxiety, help with sleep disorders. 
Um, so using those visual and auditory cues as rewards um, helps the brain, you know, um, and we that's fed back in real time, half second by half second. And the client over repetition and practice, just like anything else we learn, learns how to find its way back to uh, the most comfortable state. Um, so some of the research behind it, uh, let's see. So starting off with, so there's been many great stories, great studies proving the effic efficacy of neurofeedback, especially with PTSD, substance use, um, lot, lots of different things, especially um, autism is another one, traumatic brain injuries. Um, but a lot of it started in the 1960s. Um, Dr. Kamiata at the University of Chicago um, found that he successfully conditioned his subjects to increase their alpha production um, simply by the sound of a bell. So it kind of reminds you of Pavlov's dog. And you could think of alpha as a calm, relaxed, creative state. It's our most dominant rhythm. And I find that it's somewhat lacking in our population these days as we become busier and busier people. We're more in, in a you know faster beta type state. Um, shortly after that, um, a lot of people have heard of and know um, Dr. Barry Sturman. So Dr. Sturman in his lab in UCLA was tasked by NASA to improve their astronaut seizure threshold to rocket fuel. Um, so after many attempts, he used cats as subjects. They went through the same experience as humans. They, re they reached a level of atmospheric pressure increased gases of rocket fuel and the cats, just like the humans, had seizures and ultimately died. So there was one subse subsection of cats who did not. And he realized, you know, what's different about these cats than the others? And the cats that survived had, had actually gone through a previous research study, which included biofeedback. And so now we use um, sensory motor rhythm neurofeedback um, which is training low beta at 12 to 14 hertz, which is um, 12 to 14 cycles per second, and the sensory motor strip, which runs kind of like a rainbow from one ear to the other across, across the top of the scalp. And um, he found that using that on humans with epilepsy, 60% of his subjects reduced their seizures by 20 to 100%. And the results were also long lasting. So we still use that protocol today. Mm -hmm. So lastly, if we want to, in more um, neurofeedback research, um, I'll talk about Dr. Lubar, because I think his, his research is really interesting and something that's not credited maybe enough. But he found that neurofeedback is actually an A-level treatment for those with ADD or ADHD. So that is the same level treatment, so the best treatment available um, for people suffering with ADD or ADHD is stimulant medication. Um, it's just something that's also, it's long lasting and it's entirely holistic. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an exciting field and it continues to evolve. We're now pairing QEG analysis with psychiatry and genetic testing to find the most effective medications for psychiatric treatment. So there, there's a lot of work that's being done in this field. So always very interesting. Okay. Uh, what are some of the success rates? Um, okay, so let's see. Some of the success success rates, they vary among different populations. Um, so people with personality disorders, they're not good candidates. Uh, we'll just say that right off the bat. Those with uh, bipolar, they need a different type of neurofeedback. Um, one where there is no rewards, they're just basically receiving a mirror of the brain. Um, and it makes adjustments based on its own feedback. Um, for others, it doesn't really matter what they come in for. What we see is, uh, what the research shows is we see first a reduction in anxiety, an increase in sleep, and an increase in sense of well-being, and then I see an increase in authenticity, people being more themselves. So anecdotally, and my and what I have seen over nine years full time, so I've seen over a thousand clients for QEG neurofeedback. 
Um, so anecdotally, about 90% of my clients have reached their neurofeedback goals by 20 sessions, which 20 sessions is the standard in our field. Um, how would you find a neurofeedback practitioner? Um, so that's a really important question because there's a lot of people who've picked it up who are not licensed or should be maybe using it. Um, I would look for somebody who is, um, who is licensed, who's board certified neurotherapy, who uses brain mapping because other forms of neurofeedback are brainwave sensing machines, just like kind of the Mendy that you just kind of put over the forehead. <laughs> Um, they're brainwave sensing machines, but you cannot see what's going on underneath the scalp. So I, I always recommend, um, you know, doing something where you're looking at brain mapping, you can actually see the brain imaging and see precisely what's going on in the brain and the different hubs. So it's not just kind of one trick ponies or something that is just kind of giving the brain a mirror and not, not using those rewards and adjustments. Um, so with that, um, Brain Master's website is, is a good one to look at. That's the system that I use. Um, Aiming Clinics also uses Brain Master. Um, and you can find a practitioner near you just by putting in your zip code. Okay. Um, what types of neurofeedback are there? Um, so kind of like I was just going through, there's, you know, brain sensing neurofeedback is what I'll call it. I kind of don't want to use names of different systems, um, but they basically have a few loose electrodes and they're programmed only with three protocols. So it doesn't really, you know, no matter what your client's going through, you're going to get the same three treatments as everyone else. Um, and so that one is, is definitely very popular, but they cannot really detect what's going on in the brain and the brain might not need so much, you know, theta in the, in the, in the parietal lobe or so much, um, you know, low beta in the right hemisphere. I'm, I'm thinking of the protocols that they use. Um, also, there's ones who don't use any rewards at all. Those are ones that you can typically rent. Um, and because there are no rewards, you're basically just getting your own biofeedback, which like I said, works well for bipolar disorder, but for other disorders does not work so well. Um, so brain, Ma brain master again, is a system that I use and, uh, we use Z scores, which tell you, you know, using a biomarker match, uh, how more predispositioned you are towards different diagnoses and to what extent, um, it shows the connectivity between vital hubs and networks. And we'll look at, you know, every single voxel in your brain, we have more than 7,000 voxels or cubic millimeters in the brain. So it looks at all different areas and shows you exactly where the aberrant brainwave behavior is occurring and exactly what QEG identified protocols would work best for that person. Well, cause I know, I mean, some, sometimes, you know, when I would do neurofeedback, we would watch a movie, you know, and if the screen would go dark, then you know, I wasn't focusing enough and then it would get my attention. And then sometimes they do it with my eyes closed. And then I've had other people talk about like it being like more like a video game. It, you know. Yeah. And so I use actually all three of those in here. Okay. So those are all different, um, I guess, programs or protocols that you can use with, with, um, with neurofeedback. So with Z-score neurofeedback, my client can be sitting across the room playing a race car game with nothing but their mind. And you're right, when they're, I call it in the zone. So when they're within, let's say, 1.5 standard deviations, um, when they're within that threshold, that car is going to go and you're going to hear the roar of the engine, which is pleasing to the ear, thus to the brain. Also seeing it go, seeing the car move on its own tells the brain you did something novel. The brain likes novelty, something new. Um, and so it'll always find its way back to making that, that car curve around the, the raceway, right? Or making that screen brighter for you. Or with the eyes closed, going deep inward, doing alpha theta training. Um, so there, there's different protocols for different people. And it, it really depends precisely on that person's brain and what's needed. Okay. Um, 
because um, I feel like some people need to like you know when they walk in there. I mean, they're not going to know a lot of the science behind it, you know. And so, you know, what is that like, you know, kind of thing, you know, more or less. So the science behind it. So the rewards, you know, the brighter screen. So, you know, the the brain would always prefer to see the screen brighter or something change on the screen. Sometimes there's sparkles. Sometimes things pop up on the screen. And that tells the brain you did something right. That's something novel. That's something new. Stay there. Go back there. So your brain will always find its way back to that, to that original area. And so, you know, we're giving the client, you know, at, at every 500 milliseconds, another chance to get back into that uh, threshold or that being in the zone. Okay. So what that does for the brain rewards it in the right ways to stay in those positive frequencies. And that's looking at connections, asymmetries. So one area of the brain, we see this a lot, will we'll take over other areas of the brain. So with trauma, for example, the limbic system is usually over aroused and hijacked along with the frontal lobe. So they're interacting far too much as well. So there's an asymmetry there, but there's also over coherence. So way too much communication occurring between the limbic system and the frontal lobe. Limbic system says, do this, I'm scared. Frontal lobe says, go, right? Yes. And so when, we're, when we get that to calm down and we get that to relax and you say more of our, our um, temporal lobes, more of our creative side, you know, things like that, um, calm down the limbic system, calm down that interior cingulate that's moving way too hot then we're going to see the screen brighten up. We're going to see the car go. We're going to hear the music more melodic. Again, pleasing to the ear, thus to the brain. Okay. Um, tell us some of the success you've had with patients. Uh, let's see. So success rate. Um, I have to say I have, I can write a book on my client's success stories. And I've said that a lot, even after their very first session. Um, people often come to me when they're at the end of their rope, so to speak. So, um, you know, they've tried counseling, treatment facilities, mental hospitals, yoga, meditation, you name it. And, you know, one of the greatest quotes from a client's review, um, said, you know, she said this, she said in one session, Stephanie was able to tell us more in, in that day than a year of seeking medical treatment. So in all the doctors that, that they had seen in an entire year, I was able to point out all the discrepancies, everything going on in the brain, which made sense and was very validating for them, gave them a lot of hope. Um, people come to me with better attention, focus. They can be more present with their kids or their loved ones. Um, and also an interesting thing, I can't tell you the number of times people have come in and said, man, you know that there's this thing that used to bother me or frustrate me or make me super angry every single day, you know, every day it would bother me and stick on my mind. And today it just, I just walked past it. And I thought that was strange, didn't bother me whatsoever. And so that is something that's very, very common. And people just start to become their authentic selves. You know, neurofeedback gives us back what's been taken away you know, by trauma, by stressors, by life habits, they just kind of build and build and build and our brain overcompensates. So when we're able to use neurofeedback, it feeds those areas that are, you know, um, undercompensated. Fair enough. I mean, I know personally, I, I was able to do things that I couldn't do before. Like, I don't think I ever laughed as hard as I did before. Um, and yep. I was able to process emotions better. I mean, I'm still not great at it, but it's a lot better than it was. Um, I speak more clearly. Um, and I know uh, there was just a lot of things that, you know, I was able to break quite a few patterns. But even, I mean, even after doing the neurofeedback, 
it's taken a year or two to fully grasp all the skills, I would say. Absolutely. So noting that noticing that self-regulation, that's one of the first things we see. People become more self-aware of their habits, of their behaviors. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've had not to say that this is any part of your story, but I've had a lot of clients come in and they come in, you know, like I said, they're at the end of the rope angry, frustrated. They're, they're yelling so loud. I'm worried about my, you know, neighbors in the next office, right. About, you know, how frustrated they are with their lives. And I'm just, I just kind of let it go because in three sessions, they come in smiling, calm. Thank you, Stephanie, giving me compliments. They don't hate me. Right. Like they hated the world before and things have changed dramatically for them. So I, I see that a lot and that's, that's also, well, not, not quite a lot, but when I do see those kinds of clients, I just know, give it a few sessions. So you'll be feeling a lot better, but yeah, self-regulation is a huge one and emotional. And, and, you know, and it depends on what you're dealing with too. Um, I know with CPTSD, it takes, it takes a lot of different things to make it work. And neurofeedback helped me tremendously, but I'm, I mean, I'm still having to do EMDR. So uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And so the people that I see get better the fastest, always um, take care of their brains, take care of themselves in other ways, you know, like yoga, like doing EMDR, like seeing another therapist, you know, for psychotherapy, um, you know, eating the right foods, all those things, you know, we, we see the, them getting better faster, right? Right. So, because, I mean, I think, you know, the body keeps score is basically, I would say, one of the best guides out there for actually healing. You know, if you're mm-hmm. going to just grab a book out of pretty much anything I've read over the last, you know, five years on mental health, hands down, the best resource for finding treatments, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then one last thing on, on that note, you know, there's a lot of people walking around that I've seen, especially doing brain mapping that have concussions that weren't aware of it. Um, so that's something that I've started to really delve into deeply with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, um, lots, lots of different interventions, um, but that can cause a lot of um, symptoms, you know, of gosh, from anxiety, depression, uh, insomnia, uh, emotional outbursts, uh, emotional dysregulation, lots of things. And then you look at the brain and you can see that there's this area that's in every single, you know, uh, frequency band connection, asymmetries, coherence. You can see it clear as day. And the people who know their concussions go, that's, yeah, that's right where it happened. Right. Right. Um, So being able to feed back those areas with neurotransmitters, electrical oscillations, uh, um, blood flow, that their areas then able to detox the way it's supposed to, um, you know, they, they get better quite quickly. So that's been incredible too. So there's the concussion recovery manual, which I recommend to all my clients with concussions. I think it's as good as the body keeps the score, but for concussions. Yeah. Um, And the other thing is, is, I mean, I know people that are scared of doing this. I mean, what would, what would you say to somebody who's, you know, nervous about doing something like this? Um, Well, one thing it's non-invasive whatsoever. You know, we're listening in on your brain waves and we're feeding them back to you. So nothing's going in your head. I've had a lot of people uh, ask me if I can kind of like read their thoughts or what they're thinking. It's like, no, I cannot at all. Um, And, you know, it's the most non-invasive tool that's out there. It's completely holistic, cannot hurt you. But with that, I'll give the caveat that, you know, you need to be seeing a licensed professional that's board certified neurotherapy that has done a lot of work. And, um, you know, that's highly recommended. And you, uh, it was recommended to me that I do counseling at the same time. 
Yeah, I actually mix that in. So we start with about 20, 25 minutes of psychotherapy and going through their goals. And then we go into their protocol after that. Okay. But, but yeah, um, a lot of clients do see um, therapists as well. Okay. Anything else you would like to add that we haven't? Um, well, I guess, uh, if you're interested in neurofeedback, you can, um, always look at my website. Um, there's a lot of information. I'm very verbose on there. So there's a lot of, uh, tells you exactly how it works and maybe answer some questions that you still may have. Um, and also client testimonies are all on there as well. So, um, I have a clinic in Maui, it's neurofeedbackmaui.com. So neurofeedbackmaui.com. And I also have one here in Texas, Tyler, Te uh, Tyler neurocare.com. My Facebook pages are both, um, of the same name as well. Okay. So you can always go on there, contact me. I give free consultations, um, to whoever calls in and would like to speak. And I also rent out my systems as well the same brain master systems. Okay. Um, and you know, I know insurance is starting to cover this. Um, is there any, uh, I mean, do you, I know uh, a lot of places don't take insurance for this. You know, I, I think that that, that maybe is, that's very controversial. Um, there was a time that I tried to take insurance for neurofeedback. And what I found was the companies would say yes when I called, but then wouldn't cover it when I put on there that the first thing is neurofeedback. Now, if people, I guess, kind of uh, put on their psychotherapy instead, then they can take, right? And they use this as a modality. If they can justify it that way, then they can take insurance. But I wouldn't risk my license for it. Fair enough. I know it's, uh, it's tricky. We talk about it at all the conferences, you know, um, that I go to. So it's something that we're pushing for, but it hasn't been done yet. I think I've seen where neurofeedback is the first modality. Okay. So it's, so it's a process of the insurance, not that it won't cover it, but you have to do it a certain way to get it covered. No, not if you're using neurofeedback as that that's your main modality, then you have to put neurofeedback first and it's not covered by insurance. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, if you want to put psychotherapy first and maybe add it as a modality later, perhaps it can be covered that way. Okay. But because our sessions here are in, focused on neurofeedback and I have neuro care centers, you know, it, it would just be unethical for me to, to build that way. No, I understand that. I mean, that, you know, you got to do what you got to do to keep things legal. You know, you don't want to be caught red handed, but believe me, we're fighting for it. Absolutely. I mean, I think most places around here are about five, $6,000 for, you know, a lump sum. Some are per session, depending on where you go. Wow. Uh, that's a lot more than I charge. Uh, yeah. Some charge per session and that's a different. And then it's like 125 or something per session. So um, it just depends, gotcha. depends on uh, what, I mean, that's what, you know, and that was several years ago. I don't know if that's gone up or down. So I don't know if they had like a pet scan to begin with or, or what, but that sounds real pricey. Well, they, they do a, they do an EEG or whatever, the brain scan. QEG, yeah. uh-huh, quantified. And then they mm -hmm. would do, um, then they would just do the neurofeedback in the office and you'd watch movies while... 7,000. That, that's, that's quite a I lot. I think it was like 6,000. Yeah. So I, yeah. So mine's, uh, half that. And I would say half the, the lowest end that you said. And, um, that's for 20 sessions with the brain map. And then I go over the brain map with the person and their family if they want. 
um, for an entire 60 minutes. And so that is included in there as well. Okay. So giving them all that information, which is all research related information. Yeah. And then I comes from research. And I also know that sometime, um, some charge per session and then others do like a whole like kit, you know, they'll take you until you're done. Yeah. And I mean, I ended up doing like 40 sessions. So. Oh, ah, interesting. Interesting. But, um, no, I, uh, I think it took me about four months, which is a long time. To feel the effects or to... No, uh, I was going in four days a week for, I mean, I think I got a week or two off here and there, but it was from like September to December. And did it help oh, you? I mean, most definitely. Um, I can cry now. I couldn't cry before. Ah, uh huh, uh huh. Uh, right. I mean, I'm still not great at crying, but I can do it. Like uh, before, I cry maybe once or twice a year. Now I can cry, you know, when it's appropriate. That's excellent. You know, we don't want to selectively numb, right? We want to feel feel all of our emotions. So, and I can laugh, and I have healthier relationships. They're not quite healthy, but they're healthier. So. Good. Good. But then, you know, I think they say CPTSD takes about 10 years of therapy, and most people have tried generally have to do multiple different types of treatment before they can stop going to therapy. It's a lot. I it's hear a you. lot longer process than just. Yeah, it's more complex. Well, because I mean, your brain sure. doesn't fully develop until you're 25, and the younger the 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 trauma happens, the harder it is to treat. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And, you know, that's part of the reason why I love neurofeedback. We can reach the limbic system and retrain that instead of trying to pull at roots and try to pull information up from there. And a memory comes up, right? Where, you know, with neurofeedback, people have the cap on. And um, I don't know if you had loose electrodes or a cap, but I use a cap. And, um, you know, it's 24 sensors at one time were able to reach the limbic system and help that area to calm down in the survival networks and the parahippocampus, which takes in all the memory information from the amygdala, which is why so many people can't remember their childhoods with complex PTSD, right? It's because that amygdala was so over aroused that the parahippocampus that sits just right around it is over aroused as well and can't function. We got to use our, our survival networks more than we can our memory centers. So that, that trumps that of course. So with neurofeedback, you're able to, you know, some of the memories will pop up, but it's as if you're seeing it as a movie as something that happened instead of right in your face, like exposure therapy. Yes, most definitely. And I, I think that's why neurofeedback is so incredibly helpful for so many people. And um, I know a lot of people are very much against it, but I mean, you know, they've got electric shock therapy, which you lose a lot of your memory. And then they've got TMS, which is helpful, but it also has a lot of adverse side effects. Yeah, we don't know of any side effects with neurofeedback, except it can cause a little bit of tiredness, fatigue after the first couple sessions, because it's like taking your brain to the gym. It's optimizing your brain. No, so. I definitely felt that. Um, yeah. I mean, yep. I, I was in grad school at the time, and it was just, I could do other things, but academic stuff was almost impossible to do for, during that period of time. Mm, your brain's processing a lot and it processes between sessions as well, especially if you're doing it four times a week. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it was, it was exhausting, but you know, 
I mean, I used to tell people it's kind of like emotional chemo. Like it's like chemo without the nausea. That's how tired you are. Ah, uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. So I usually see that in the first few sessions, but not after that. Um, and like I said, I've seen over a thousand clients. So after the first week, I have not seen people be that fatigued. Although if you're working on a lot of trauma, right, based on the limbic system, then that's where, you know, maybe your practitioner place the, the Z score training. Right. And it wasn't more in the frontal lobes and things like that, where you need, you need, you need that for academics, your temporal lobe. Yeah, no, it was. So I, I can't speak to, to what your practitioner used or, or did, but. No, I mean, it was, I mean, I, you know, I would just stare at the computer screen and nothing would come out. Nothing. I hear that a I hear that a lot of times when people first come in. Yeah. Um, but then I mean I have an A score of six, so that's a pretty high A score to have. So you're able to make it through it and at the end was it was that better academic? Um, I mean I think it took me probably six months, maybe even a year to like I mean I ended up flunking out because, well, one, I was taking too many classes and trying to do that. Um, I mean, there was multiple things and then COVID hit, but um, it just wore me out. Like it, I think probably sometime after the first year I started, you know, first two months, you know, I was starting to be less tired and then probably after a year, you know, a lot of the connections and everything started to just work much better. There you go. Right. But I mean, that's what trauma does, depending on, you know, the severity of it. Right, right. Which is why I recommend Z-score training, where we look at coherence and commu communication between all those vital hubs and networks and how they're working, you know, so we can train those areas with the frequency balance and all those, you know, 7,000 plus voxels all at once. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, it definitely helped me tremendously, uh, but I do know, you know, the effects of childhood trauma are horrific. I hear you. I do not disagree. Uh, but no. Uh, and I think that's one thing. I mean, that's why I do this show is because there are so many people that are just struggling to function in everyday life. And neurofeedback is a tool that can help. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you would like to add? Um, that's it again. You know, my, my website, uh, if you're on the West coast, maybe neurofeedbackmaui.com. And if you're more in the center of the U S uh, Tyler neurocare, uh, dot com. And my Facebook pages again are the same. They have a lot of good information on them as well. So, um, also you can look me up, you can call one 70 neuro N E U R O for your consultation. I get free consultations via phone. Um, I say 20 minutes, they typically last 40 minutes, but either way, I like to get to the root of what's going on with the client and truly explain how I can help or how, how this can help them. Fair enough. All right. I think that's it. Thanks, guys, for listening. This is uh, Rachel in Recovery. We've got, you know, follow us on your favorite podcasts or social media. And as always, if you have any questions, uh, reach out to Rachel in Recovery.